sorry, it was an awkward <laughs> kind of time. <laughs> 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 like, hope it's with the live stream audience. You really need to have a start early. Okay. All right, I think we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, so welcome to Science-Based Choices for Climate Action um, at Dickinson College. Um, we've had some excellent sessions uh, this morning, some, some really good uh, conversations, good questions, uh, really pleased with how things are going. Um, uh, we've got a good audience here in person. Thank you for those who are here in person and are putting up with the very frigid temperatures in the room. Uh, I'm hoping that, that we'll be more comfortable uh, uh, soon. Uh, welcome to those who are watching the uh, live stream of, uh, of this event. Uh, the session that we're doing now is um, Pathways uh, to Net Zero Carbon Emissions. Um, uh, Professor Tony Underwood is our moderator for the session. He'll introduce our, our panelists. Um, we're going to have uh, partway through this session, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, for the in-person audience, raise your hand, uh, wait, wait for a microphone to come to you. Uh, we're going to ask our, our mic runners to give priority first to students for their questions uh, uh, first. Um, if you're watching the live stream, you can type questions into the chat and we'll be monitoring those and passing those questions on to the moderator uh, for the panel to address. And so with that, I turn it over to, uh, to Professor Underwood. Uh, thank you, Neil. As Neil said, I'm Tony Underwood. I'm an associate professor in the economics department here at Dickinson College. Thanks to you all for being here in person. Thanks to those of you on the live stream for joining us. Uh, as he suggested, we're going to talk about, about pathways to net zero carbon emissions here today. Uh, I want to start first by uh, having our panelists briefly introduce themselves, uh, and then we'll get into some questions and, of course, leave a good chunk of time for you all to ask questions uh, shortly. Uh, Anand, can we start with you? Sure. Thanks, Tony, and um, really happy to be here. My name is Anand Patwardhan. I'm a professor in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland and College Park. Um, and just as, as Tony mentioned, so I've been involved with the IPCC for, for quite some time, though uh, fortunately or unfortunately not with the sixth assessment cycle, uh, but certainly the third, fourth, and fifth assessment reports and the third assessment was where uh, I had the privilege of working closely with Neil. Uh, but mostly in working group two that looks at uh, impacts and vulnerabilities, although I have spent some time uh, working on energy-related issues as well. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Roberto, can we go to you? Make sure our live <laughs> audience can hear us all right. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry for not being able to join you in person. My name is Roberto Schaefer. I'm a full professor of energy economics at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And I have been collaborating with the IPCC since 1998. So I have been involved in more than, more not, exactly six IPCC reports, once as a review editor, two times as the lead author, and three times as a coordinating lead author, including the most recent IPCC Working Group 3 report, which is basically what we're going to be discussing today. So thank you very much for your invitation. My pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks, Steve. Great. Um, first of all, let me say thanks for the opportunity to be here, Neil, uh, and thank you all for your interest in the topic. Uh, so I'm Stephen Rose. I'm a senior research economist uh, at EPRI uh, in the climate systems and, uh, sorry, in the energy systems and climate analysis research group there. Um, I've worn a number of hats uh, with respect to the IPCC over many years. I've been a lead author on the last three assessment reports uh, for the fourth and fifth uh, as a lead author for working group three. Uh, and most recently for the sixth assessment report as a lead author for working group two. Uh, that's on impacts. 
I've also had the, the pleasure of being on the cross working group coordination team with respect to climate scenarios. So this is trying to think about how we can utilize some of the common information with respect to climate projections and future societies across the working group to, uh, to help uh, sort of integrate uh, the stories that are developing within those assessments. Thank you all again for being here and providing your expert expertise to us. I want to start, I think, by what might be um, a non-obvious question, <laughs> right, to some of us in the room here, uh, and start by just clarifying what we mean when we say uh, net zero carbon emissions. Is that different than net zero greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and how might we be framing that moving forward in our conversation? Uh, Roberto, can you start us off with that? Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, very important question. Uh, reaching net zero carbon or net zero CO2 is about the same. Uh, is a necessary condition to halt global warming at any level. So we can be talking about 1.5 degree warming world, 2 degree, 3 degree. In order to stabilize the temperature, we need to reach net zero CO2. But what's important to say here is that the at the point of net zero, the amount of CO2 human uh, activity is put into the, the atmosphere has to be uh, equal to the amount of CO2 human activity is removing from the atmosphere. So what does this mean? Let's say basically this means that because we know that there are some, let's say, economic sectors that are what we call hard to abate sectors, which will probably never be net zero emissions, we have to have some sectors of the economy that need to go to net negative emissions to compensate for those positive emissions from other sectors. This applies to not only CO2, but all greenhouse gas emissions. But when you talk about negative emissions, we normally talk about negative emissions of CO2, meaning that in order to be net, net zero greenhouse gas emissions, we have to be well below zero CO2 emissions to compensate for positive emissions from methane from agriculture, and 2 from agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. So what's important to say is that we need to go to net zero CO2 to stabilize global temperature, but we need to go to net zero GHG to decrease uh, temperatures over time. So two very important concepts that we're going to be able to, to discuss more today. Thank you. Anything you two want to add to that before we move forward? Uh, okay, so I, I think an, uh, another helpful place to get us the conversation started today, but more broadly, is an understanding. We've heard a lot already this morning about particular targets, so to speak, in terms of levels of warming, 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius. Um, we've heard some mention of the Paris Agreement from 2015 and the pledges that many nations uh, committed to at that time. So I'd like, can we can just lay out briefly um, which pathways, emissions pathways, are consistent with meeting some of those targets and what that means in terms of um, different levels of warming by the end of the century? Uh, Roberto, I think, is going to pull a slide up here. Yeah, can you see my slides already? Yes, maybe go full screen still. There we go. Yep. Okay. So, very important issue here. So basically what I'm sharing with you are some key figures for, from this I, recent IPCC report where basically in my chapter, chapter three, which is about long-term mitigation pathways, we have been able to assess from the literature more than 2,000 long-term mitigation scenarios. And out of these more than 2,000 scenarios, we selected seven scenarios that we call illustrative uh, uh, pathways. And out of these seven illustrative pathways that I'm showing here on the screen, five of them, we call them uh, illustrative mitigation pathways. And basically we see here, let's say that this GS pathway, which means global strengthening, we see the negative pathway, which we, is based on negative emissions. We see the, the one called REM, which is based on a lot of renewable energy. Then LD, let's say low demand, and the SP, which, which is the a, a acronym for shifting pathways. So basically, this GF pathway is one comparable with a two-degree warming world by the end of the century. 
Then the negative pathway is comparable with a 1.5 degree uh, world in 2100, but with a high overshoot in the middle of the road. Basically, temperature reaching 1.7, 1.8 degrees, and then going down to 1.5 because we have a lot of negative emissions afterward. Then the REM, LB, and SP are 1.5 degree uh, scenarios without overshoot. So what we show here is that we have different pathways to be comparable with the Paris Agreement with implications in terms of use of or emission of non-CO2 gases, the role of emissions from industry, fossil fuel emissions of CO2, use of technology like direct air capture, use of land use change technologies, using of BEC, which is biomass with carbon capture and storage, and then, let's say, in, in this next slide, in my final slide, we see exactly the same illustrative pathways, but now indicating what's the role of the energy sector in these different pathways. And then we can see very clearly that, for example, nuclear, fossil fuels, biomass, be it traditional or non-traditional biomass, or renewable energy, can play completely different uh, roles over time, for these different pathways, all of them, or all of, all of them, compare with a 1.5 degree without overshoot, or 1.5 overshoot, or 2 degrees and that. So these were key figures, or key conclusions, of the current IPCC report, meaning that there is no single pathway, let's say, to be compliant with the Paris Agreement. There are various possibilities, and basically the IPCC cannot be prescriptive, but it has to indicate that there are many ways to reach our objective, but we have to start now. So we cannot delay action. We have to do something very soon, 2025, if not even before that, in order to be able to keep temperature below 2 degrees and eventually even below 1.5 degrees. So many ways to get there, but we have to do something. So this is a, a key, let's say, conclusion from the most recent IPCC report. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very helpful description of these different pathways. So it's consistent with what we heard some this morning, that what the IPCC is doing is being policy relevant, but not poly policy prescriptive. The same is true here in these pathways, right? There are many different avenues by which we can achieve different emissions reductions targets. Um, some that are relying more on renewable energies, some that are relying more on negative, um, negative carbon technologies. Uh, so, Anand, maybe can, can you speak briefly to um, where we are in terms of emissions annually, where we're headed, and of some of these pathways that Roberto had just discussed, when do global emissions need to peak in, along some of these different pathways, and what does that emissions gap look like? Great, thanks very much, um, Tony. So just to, to start with, maybe just to sort of uh, um, uh, follow on what Roberto said. So the basic idea is that uh, the amount of temperature increase is roughly proportional to the cumulative emissions of carbon, which means there's a carbon budget associated with any particular level of temperature change. So if you have a 1.5 degree target, you have an associated carbon budget. If you have a two-degree target, you have an associated carbon budget. But it also means that the more stringent the target, the smaller is the budget. So the smaller should be the area under the curves that uh, Roberto showed you just now. And what it also means that if you exceed the budget, then you must have negative emissions so that you can make it all make the math add up, right? And so the uh, the more you delay uh, doing a mitigation. Uh, the more you are likely to exceed the budget, which means the greater is the amount of negative emissions you might need later, right? So kind of this notion that there is, uh, that each of these curves that Roberto showed you uh, has an area under it which corresponds to what your carbon budget is. So obviously, as Tony said, the question is, uh, we have a, a pretty good idea of the kinds of pathways we need to be on in order to be consistent with or to meet different uh, temperature targets, uh, 1.5 or 2. Uh, if you could just have the slide, please. Um, yes, thank you. So, uh, so obviously the question then is, okay, we have an idea of where we need to be, so where are we now? 
Um, and so what this slide shows you is the notion of the gap between what is needed and what is happening. Uh, so you can see there's a pretty substantial gap between uh, both where we need to be, and so the downward sloping pathways you see are the ones, the envelopes that, that allow you to remain within 1.5 or 2 degrees. Uh, so the green one is limit warming to 2 degrees. Uh, the blue one, which is the lowest one, is the limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So you really need to be on very aggressive downward sloping uh, curves in terms of when emissions should peak. So obviously uh, what this figure will show you is that emissions should be peaking right now, essentially. Uh, and then they should be declining uh, very soon uh, towards uh, mid-century. Uh, the um, uh, businesses, so if you look at current policies, they, we are quite far away from where, we, which is the top uh, envelope. Uh, we are quite far away from where we need to be. And you can actually look at the size of that emissions gap uh, in, in the year 2030. And obviously, looking further out into the future, uh, there is a substantial gap between what has been committed and where we need to be on. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, just a, a couple additional reflections with respect to some of the questions that you asked um, with respect to current emissions. So for those of you not sort of tracking uh, progress um, in terms of emissions over time, um, emissions are still on the rise on a global basis, right? So despite uh, some of the setbacks that we're currently experiencing with economies and inflation and so on and, and energy crisis, uh, we still have emissions on the rise. Uh, so that's something important to note. Um, and you saw that in each of the examples that Roberto gave uh, with respect to 2 degrees and 1.5 degrees that we're talking about a need for peaking of emissions. Uh, matter of fact, you can actually look at sort of the broader set of emissions scenarios that are there, and you see that even to limit warming below 3 degrees, we need to peak emissions. Uh, so we need to be thinking about peaking emissions at some point. Uh, the sooner we get there, the better chance, uh, the better the chance uh, of staying below uh, two degrees, and certainly the better the chance of staying below 1.5 degrees. Um, the other thing I would highlight is uh, Roberto showed you just the illustrative pathways. There's this much broader database that's there. Uh, one of my functions with Working Group Two was actually to utilize the uh, scenario database from Working Group Three. So I spent a lot of time with that data, uh, and we see that there's a lot of different pathways. Uh, so the seven is just a small set of what's there with respect to 1.5 degrees and also with respect to limiting warming below two degrees. So there's a couple ways to interpret that. One is that uh, there's a lot of different pathways for doing it. Um, that to me is something that's useful to know. So there's not just one, and if we get it wrong, we're, we're not gonna be able to do it. Uh, there's a lot of different possibilities. So that's good to be able to recognize those different possibilities and what they mean. Uh, the other is that there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so those different pathways, if you know how those models are working, are cost-effective pathways for a given set of assumptions. So you vary the assumptions, you get a different pathway. Uh, so we need to be thinking about those assumptions uh, and the uncertainties that they represent. So as we move into the future, those are uh, important features that we want to be thinking about in terms of what might be some of the randomness associated with where we'll go, um, but also how do we think about translating those uncertainties into enabling conditions. How do we turn them into the uh, futures that are going to make it uh, easier uh, and, and less challenging to be able to realize these kinds of climate outcomes? Um, the last thing I'll just highlight is, uh, and Roberto didn't, was, didn't give you that perspective, is how to look at things sub-globally. Um, so we've been doing some, some work um, with my research group. Where we've been looking at global pathways and evaluating sub-global pathways and economies that are consistent with a global pathway. So take any global emissions pathway and we're trying to understand what might the emissions and the uncertainty and distribution of potential futures look like for a country, for a sector within a country, uh, and for their transition. Uh, so that's also useful to know because it helps us think about if we're trying to, as a globe, pursue a particular pathway, what are the possibilities in terms of being consistent with realizing that global pathway, but also what are the risks? Right? So we can see, again, what that risk looked like in terms of the nature of the transformations and the, the magnitude of the challenge, uh, but also the costs associated with it. Yeah, you raise a really good point, Steve, and I, I think I want to stick with that for a minute. We've seen historically that the responsibility for historical emissions has been very unequal. Um, and so going forward, what might these net zero global net zero targets mean for nations at vastly different levels of development 
with vastly different levels of historical responsibility for cumulative emissions. How should we think about net zero targets through that lens? So if, if I could jump in, uh, Tony. So, so the first thing, I think, there's two things. The first is, uh, as, uh, as Steve and Roberto said, there are many pathways. Not all, path, all pathways are not created equal. Mm -hmm. They may all have the same effect in terms of meeting, let's say, a climate target. But they are very different in terms of the technologies they may use uh, and their implications in terms of institutions and policies. So from a policy perspective, they really are quite different. So the LD pathway, for example, that Roberto showed, which was low demand, really requires some fundamentally different ways of thinking about behavioral change and how do you get uh, reduced demand, right? Which is very different from a pathway that, let's say, uh, deploys large amounts of renewable technology very quickly, uh, which is more on the, if you will, on the supply side. So that's kind of the first thing to keep in mind is that from a policy perspective, these pathways might look actually very different. The other thing is what we have shown so far have been global pathways. And as Tony said, a global net zero, let's say, of 2050 does not, and in fact, some might say from an equity perspective, should not mean uh, the same net zero year for all countries, right? So one of the key ideas underlying uh, the climate convention is the notion of common but differentiated responsibility. What this means is that different countries have contributed differently to, to the climate problem. And so for developing countries, it's very important that uh, they are, uh, in a sense, pursuing their development objectives. So you might say from a developing country perspective, the framing is not necessarily one of mitigation, but of avoidance. How do I uh, develop while still avoiding uh, to emit more? Right? So the notion of low carbon development as opposed to traditional mitigation will say we are going to peak and then uh, reduce uh, to zero. Um, so just to illustrate that, maybe if I could just have a slide. Let's see if this works. Could you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Uh, so it, there's a lot of data, a lot of detail on this slide. I, I don't want you to look at all of the, the detail, but just, just look at the ranges, right? So, so the, the main takeaway message from this slide is that there is actually a whole range of potential net zero years, and therefore a range of different pathways different countries could take that could still potentially add up uh, to, uh, to a global uh, pathway. And, and the key question here really is one of burden sharing. How do we design or how can institutions allow for a more equitable burden sharing of effort of mitigation across different countries based on notions of responsibility? Thanks. Right. Steve, you, you suggested that you know, these different, we should think about these policy, these pathways when it comes to implementation from a kind of sub-global, even sub-national perspective. Um, can you talk us through kind of the trade-offs there between places where we need large-scale investment um, in terms of technologies and the types of changes that are made, right? I'm thinking in terms of energy efficiency, conservation, um, you know, changes large-scale changes in land use, uh, even things like carbon capture technologies that could give us, get us significant levels of net, net negative or even net zero emission, net zero or net negative emissions um, kind of post 2050 in parts of where, in parts of the world where those types of technologies perhaps could be afforded. Um, it was a packed question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to figure out how to break it down. Yeah. Um, so a couple thoughts. One, I just want to follow up on the, on the comment the, on on-band uh, about not all, uh, pathways are not all equal. Yeah. Um, I think that's important to stress. Uh, so as we look at those different pathways, they have different characteristics, not only in terms of the technologies that are being deployed, uh, but also the implications, right? So we need to think about these pathways from a multidimensional point of view. Uh, in terms of understanding what they might mean in terms of societal transformation, uh, 
uh, and what they might mean in terms of trade-offs. Uh, and one of the things that we learned uh, in the success report, which is maybe not so surprising, is that there really are trade-offs on all these pathways, and it's a matter of really understanding what those trade-offs look like and thinking about how can we balance them. Uh, so it's not really a matter of eliminating them, because they're going to be trade-offs one way or another, but really about how can we uh, think about managing and balancing those trade-offs. Uh, so that's, that's important from a, not only from a global perspective, but this kind of circling back to your, your question about local. Um, it's really important from a local perspective, right? When we look at individual locations, whether it's Carlisle or, or someplace else in the world, um, you, every location has a different set of opportunities. Uh, so you're really talking about a, a, a different uh, market condition, uh, a different local culture, a, a different system from an infrastructure point of view, uh, different local policies. Uh, all those things imply different opportunities. Uh, they also imply different risks. Uh, so that's important to one, recognize. Uh, so when we start talking about local strategies, uh, they're not going to be the same uh, from one location to the next. Uh, so that's important to, as we think about sort of the portfolio of options, whether we're trying to decarbonize energy supply in, in terms of electricity and fuels, or decar think about decarbonization with the energy demand in terms of potentially changing consumer preferences or uh, retrofitting facilities and things like that. Um, it's not going to be the same everywhere. Uh, thinking about bringing in land, right, those are just going to be a different set of opportunities with respect to each location. Uh, so that's one thing that's really important to recognize uh, and in terms of uh, trying to move forward and implement uh, approaches. Uh, that's difficult sometimes, uh, and that's actually one of the places I feel like the IPCC kind of gets you uh, sort of to a certain point in terms of understanding the problem and starting to think about the fact that there's something that you need to deal with and then giving you some ideas of how to deal with it, but then starting to actually implement those on the ground requires its own set of analysis uh, to really characterize those opportunities uh, and be able to think about those risks and how you're going to manage those risks and balance the trade-offs. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I, I want to, because we're here and we're thinking about targets and perhaps how quickly some of these changes can be made, I want to bring in a couple of uh, questions from our live stream audience here before we come back to and kind of move on a bit. Um, we, have, we have two related questions coming in the live stream. Um, Richard, who's asking, you know, could one of you speak to natural and or technical forms of carbon removal? that could restore our climate to a more livable CO2 range of, say, 300 parts per million. Um, and Michael McCracken, who's also asking that because climate change has altered the carbon cycle through thawing permafrost, carbon fluxes, uh, net zero won't change, won't stop these changes in atmospheric concentrations of CO2. And don't we need more than net zero, meaning don't we need um, net negative carbon removal technologies to achieve any of these targets that keep us below two degrees C. Um, maybe Roberto, can I start with you on that? I know that was a lot, but can we start with you there and see where that takes us? Yes, thank you. Yeah, indeed, very, very good questions. And when I, I show the different pathways, in particular the pathway we call NEC, means that we're going to need to rely a lot on negative emissions in case we delay actions and we have to try to compensate for an excess of carbon budget, as Anand already commented, to try to reduce or even have negative emissions to, to reduce what we have emitted uh, to the atmosphere. Different ways to do that, let's say, we, we, we have what you call nature-based solutions, like afforestation, reforestation. This is a great possibility for many countries, including developing countries. But also, chances are that we're going to need to rely on some, let's say, technology-based solutions, like PECS, which is biomass with carbon capture and storage, eventually PEC, direct air capture, and many other fixes based on, on technology. The problem here is that some of these technologies are not commercially available, eventually are too expensive, and eventually will never deliver what we're expecting from them. And that's why, let us say, uh, we really have to, to act on the, the safe side, meaning that we have to do something as soon as possible, and in that case, renewables are somehow a kind of proof technologies. A low energy demand is the way to go. But, let's say, chances are that, because of many delays, we're going to need to rely 
at some point in time with some, uh, in, uh, in some let's say, negative emission technologies, which are sometimes very controversial. I agree with that. But uh, we, we, don't have, we, we have no choice anymore. Uh, and, and I mentioned that because we have some sectors that are hard to abate, let's say, issues of methane from agriculture are not easy to deal with. The same applies to nitrogen from fertilizers. So because those sectors, you continue to emit non-CO2 gases, we have to have negative CO2 emissions coming from other places. In that case, nature-based solutions is a good solution. No, let's say, side effect in principle to have more forest, more forestation, more reforestation. But then also, let's say, uh, many other issues involved where, let's say, th those actions will take place. We discussed this a little bit already. Let's say, developing countries or developed countries, if this is the, the priority of some developing countries that have to produce more food for their population. So, very complicated issue. And I guess Anand, Anand and also Steve were able to comment on that. My final comment here, and Steve raised that issue, the, 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 the scenarios that I show to you are global scenarios, very much based on least cost solutions, meaning that this is the least cost solution for the globe, which doesn't mean that this is the least cost solution for those places where some of those options will have to be deployed. And in fact, let's say, when you look at some of these scenarios, in some of them, developing countries reach net zero before developed countries, which from a kind of fairness principle is not reasonable, but from a global point of view is a least cost solution, meaning that we have to have, let's say, a proper mechanism in place, finance, let's say, transfer of technology in order to allow developing countries to do what's expected from them, what, which is not exactly their first choice. And that's why we have to, to really uh, be careful here, because we're talking about different realities, but one single global problem. So this is the complexity of the issue we're discussing here. Thank you. I'll jump into it. Yeah, I was going to say, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, uh, Roberto just laid about 20 topics on the table for us. Um, we could spend the whole day or week probably talking about all those. So thanks, Roberto. It's actually you got a lot of good stuff out. Um, I'm just going to comment a little bit on carbon dioxide removal. Uh, that was uh, one of the questions that was uh, online. Uh, so Roberto uh, sort of laid out these different strategies for removing carbon from the atmosphere. So it's a way essentially to remove emissions that have been put into the atmosphere in the past and help us essentially steer the climate more quickly. Uh, so uh, planting trees, uh, for example, we take advantage of photosynthesis and, and pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, we can do it with technology in terms of what's called direct air capture. Uh, so that's a, you're actually pulling carbon dioxide out through chemical processes, for example, and then you're sequestering that carbon below ground. Uh, bioenergy with CCS, that could be a bioelectricity where you're producing power from burning biomass and you're capturing that, C that CO2 and sequestering it below ground. Could be uh, refineries where you're producing using liquid fuels, also capturing the CO2. It could be hydrogen production. So there's a number of ways to use bioenergy, uh, potentially in different parts of the economy to provide uh, different fuels and, and ultimately services. Um, what we see when we look at the pathways, like Roberto showed, uh, is that some kind of carbon dioxide removal technology is probably essential. Right? When we talk about trying to limit warming below 2 degrees, much less 1.5 degrees, and we think about where we're headed right now with current global emissions and where we're currently situated with respect to current policy, those technologies, those carbon dioxide remote technologies are becoming increasingly important uh, for being able to steer the climate. Uh, so that's something that's really important, I think, for everybody to recognize. Uh, it changes the conversation. You need to be thinking about how can we actually put these technologies into play. Uh, they're not meant to be a free pass. It's just meant to be an important strategy for steering the climate system. Um, there was another question about uh, more than net zero. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of goes back to what is net zero actually represent? It was just a crossing point. Uh, so if you go back to the IPCC's 1.5 degree report, it's not meant to be you hit net zero and then you're done and you stay at zero. It's just that's where we were crossing over uh, into that negative space. Uh, so really, uh, it's not just about net zero. It is about continuing to figure out how we can go below, which again highlights these carbon dioxide removal technologies as being really important. And we should circle back on finance at some point. But. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think what I want to, Anandi, yeah, I'll, I'll hand it back off to you. Uh, I'll, 
we're going to transition to getting some questions from the audience here shortly. So if you want to be thinking about, especially students, what questions you might have for our panelists, uh, we'll be opening that up here shortly. Uh, Anand, I was going to come back to you um, both to add anything to the conversation here, but also to think about, um, you know, what are the what are these factors that may kind of inhibit this transition, and maybe some that would facilitate it. Uh, and in particular, we know already from what you've said previously about um, the historical differences in terms of emissions and contributions to cumulative emissions, that there are issues of energy security, energy poverty, energy inequality in all of this. And to what degree is that itself a inhibiting factor in all of this? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so there's a lot. Just uh, maybe just to add a, a little bit to this to the previous conversation. So, obviously, when you reach net zero, you get stabilization of concentration. But I think the question also was, how do you return concentrations to uh, to where they were? And that obviously requires very large amounts of of negative emissions. And the problem with a lot of negative emissions technologies is that they are either using technologies that are very expensive or um, or uh, they essentially have large spillover effects. So if you're going to do large scale uh, afforestation or if you're going to do large scale deployment of bioenergy plus CCS, you obviously need land. And there's obviously now uh, you've got to start thinking about competition uh, between uh, land for food versus land for energy versus land for other uses. So it kind of gets into the whole range of, of negative spillovers. Which actually gets me to the, the question you posed in terms of what's holding us back, right? So you see that we have, you can see there's a fairly large gap between where we need to be and where we are. And I'd say there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one is, and I think the reasons vary. The reasons vary across contexts. So I would say uh, in, in many places, I think, Perhaps we have not done as good a job as we need to to connect what seems to be a very long-term agenda in terms of climate policy. You know, we're talking about net zero, we're talking about 2050 and 2060. And if you think about, okay, how does that connect to a politician standing for re-election? It's not quite sure how a 40-year agenda <laughs> becomes salient to someone who's thinking about the next years or five years. Right? So I think one of the challenges for us is figuring out how to connect the long term with the near term. And the near term, if you sort of ask people what are the major concerns right now, well, you start today, you talk about inflation, and you talk about energy uh, security and gas prices, and you start talking about uh, energy poverty and lack, a lack of access. And so in some ways, I think the real challenge is in figuring out where do these agendas overlap? Where does the long-term agenda of decarbonization connect to some of the near-term uh, issues that are much more perhaps salient? And obviously, salience is very context-dependent, right? What may be salient here in Kala and Pennsylvania may, may not be salient in DC, may not be salient at all in Europe or in the developing world, where the developing world is really uh, grasping with, uh, you know, we saw in the morning, uh, Salim is dealing with uh, a power outage because of a cyclone, or there is uh, colleagues in South Africa uh, who have load shedding, or, or there is communities that have no energy access at all, right? So we have a very different contextual situation, and I think part of the uh, uh, challenge is in making that connection between sort of you know, the, the longer term global agenda and the much more near term uh, policy and political pressures that are driving, uh, uh, you know, decision making at, at local scales. And I think there are points of overlap, there are points of synergy, but we have to get much more creative at finding what those are. And I think that's part of the, uh, part of the challenge. Uh, Steve, maybe I'll ask you to touch on the role of finance in all of this as a either inhibiting factor or perhaps maybe even something that can reduce some of these uncertainties we're facing in this transition. Uh, then we'll begin taking some questions. Sure. I'm, I'm going to combine the facilitation yep. and yep. finance uh, thing yep. and maybe broaden a little bit. Um, so uh, one of the things that you see when you look at the kinds of pathways that Roberto was showing, and we didn't get into that much of the regional detail, but you got a little bit from Anand's slide. 
um, is that there's some potentially great mitigation efforts for reducing emissions in other parts of the world, in the developing world. Um, so that raises questions about, well, what does that mean? Uh, what do you do with that information? Does it mean that those uh, parts of the world should be steering their economies in dramatic ways towards these low carbon uh, pathways that the models are producing? Um, it, it's, that's, that's one way to translate it. Um, another is, is really just this, raises this question about who actually supports those transitions. Uh, the models don't make any of those kinds of political decisions. They're just looking for where the lowest cost solutions are. Um, and that's helpful in that regard because it identifies opportunities for us uh, on a global basis and as a global community for decarbonizing. Uh, so then that gives us some input into thinking about those political decisions about how to support uh, transitions with uh, some of the, the lowest uh, trade-offs. Uh, so trying to find where some of those least cost uh, uh, emissions reduction opportunities lie is, is then helpful for us to then think about how do we mobilize to make that happen. Uh, and that gets us to finance, right? So we can think about uh, how do we then uh, provide the resources to be able to support those transitions. Uh, and I view those as a win-win opportunity, right? So for those countries that offer some of those low carbon uh, and low cost, uh, low carbon opportunities, uh, that's a revenue opportunity for them. Uh, that's an opportunity for them to essentially uh, have a facilitated transition uh, to a low carbon future uh, supported by the developed countries and the developed countries are able to find lower cost mitigation uh, to help essentially steer the climate uh, in the way that we want to. Uh, so there's a real opportunity there. Uh, the finance question itself is much more complex than that. It's not simply sort of at the international negotiation level about money moving between countries. Uh, you get down to a, a lot more specifics about potentially funding individual technologies. You get to questions about uh, even there's a whole other dimension of finance with respect to uh, how individual companies are being, uh, being uh, rated uh, with respect to uh, their own climate-related risks. It's another topic altogether. Uh, so that, that's a, a, the broader, there's this questions of facilitation with respect to how do we think about mobilizing resources uh, to where uh, that we can uh, reduce emissions most cost-effectively. Um, another important element of facilitation is good policy. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is policy that's going to facilitate coordination and policy that's going to provide flexibility. Uh, given the level of ambition we're talking about here, this dramatic uh, sort of redirection of global emissions and, and redirection of the climate, uh, we need to be able to have flexibility. We need policies that are going to facilitate coordination. We, there's no way we can get there if we have every organization, every country operating on their own. Uh, we really do need to have that cross-country coordination. Um, other than other part and, uh, element of facilitation is education. Uh, so continuing to educate the public, educate the stakeholder community, uh, so that they're able to have an informed conversation about the paths forward. Uh, and that's happening, that's great. Um, the IPCC helps with that, but a lot of it requires all of you and events like this to make that happen too. Um, and that's really important uh, so that when we're talking about these things, we're talking about pragmatic strategies uh, for being able to achieve these outcomes. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up to questions. Do we have any questions from the in-person audience? <laughs> Looks like we have one over here in the front. Hi. So um, I teach a class at Penn State where at the end of the semester, I ask students to imagine it's the year 20, well, I ask them to imagine it's 50 years into the future, usually. And I ask them to write the story of how things are then, what we did or didn't do, and what the consequences of that now are. And you all have laid out all of these possible pathways and, and how we approach them. But I'm wondering, I kind of want to pose that question to you. What do you think we're actually going to do or not do? And what will it look like in 50 years? <laughs> so what is your case for climate optimism here? Uh, and I, I guess I will come to one of the uh, Questions from a remote audience from Ian who asks, how do you respond to claims of climate doomers, that it's too late to act no matter what? Which is, I think, a similar question in terms of uh, climate dystopia, perhaps 50 years from now. Uh, so who wants to start? <laughs> I guess uh, the question is, who has the crystal ball? But uh, 
but I can. Um, so let me let me let me start. Um, I, I guess I, I I'm an optimist because you know what else could I be, right? I mean, why would you know? It's better to hope than than to despair. I guess so that's that's where I am. But I think the um, you know there's you sort of have to, as I see it, there's sort of a combination of where of what we would like to be and where things are, right? So you kind of have to always balance those two. I think, as Steve and others have said, clearly uh, we are not on track to meet 1.5 or 2 degrees, right? So we are, you know, looking as of now at a, you know, maybe 2 degree plus future. What that means on the ground can vary quite a lot because I think we haven't yet in this symposium talked about adaptation and about how we can respond, anticipate and respond, and there's a lot that can happen there. So I think, you know, that will come up uh, later. But uh, uh, I, I would always like to imagine, uh, you know, a world that is, um, uh, that is still capable of um, act, collective action to respond. And, um, you know, that there are, uh, this is, that the, we're hopefully not in another extinction uh, uh, episode as yet. All right, so maybe I'll even offer a more optimistic <laughs> perspective. Um, a, a couple of things I would I would say. One is we've actually made progress. Um, so it, it's hard, you know, we're talking about peaking of emissions and we still need to be striving for that. That's, that's clear. Um, but if you look at where we were headed uh, just 10 years ago, right, we're on a different trajectory. Uh, so we've already, the actions we've taken have steered uh, the path uh, to some degree. Now, we haven't stopped emissions from rising, uh, but we still are on a different trajectory, and that's progress. Uh, and also, I would say, the, you know, awareness is high, right? We've changed the conversation. So the history that Linda uh, recounted for you in terms of how uh, our understanding of the science has changed, uh, that has changed the conversation. Uh, if you look at the political dynamics and you go back to the Bush administration in this country, uh, the political conversation changed all the way back then in, in W's administration, uh, where we suddenly uh, were now no longer talking uh, at that point about whether the climate was changing, but what do we do about it? Uh, so I actually feel like that's where most of the conversation is now. There are still people who maybe call things into question, but very few. Most of it's about what do we do. Uh, and if you look at what's happening in the broader community, uh, so in the business community, in the finance sector, uh, in local communities and everywhere, climate is front and center. Um, yes, there are clearly some distractions right now that are really important to deal with, uh, immediate priorities. Uh, but its climate is on people's mind. And that's, that's actually a lot of progress in my mind uh, in terms of people looking for a, a way to participate in the solutions going forward. Now, you mentioned adaptation hadn't come up. It's clear that we're going to see more climate change. Um, that's, we have to be realistic about that. We've had about a degree of warming. If you look at the most ambitious paths, paths that uh, Working Group 1, uh, the physical science working group evaluated, we see more warming. Uh, and those ambitious passes, paths are very optimistic. Uh, so we're going to have more warming. That just means we need to be getting ready for that too. So we can talk about, um, uh, we need to be talking about the mitigation and steering the emissions pathway. But we also need to be thinking about how do we plan for the future uh, and, and, and realize that we're going to have some additional warming. Uh, Roberto, how about your? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, let, let me add here, let's say. I'm, I'm also, let's say, optimistic. And the reason I'm optimistic, because as Steve said, we're beginning to see some changes already. When you look, for example, at the car industry, we have many manufacturers that have already announced that they are going to ban the production of uh, internal en engine combustion, internal combustion engines by 2027, 2030. Many countries in Europe have already declared that they have to, you need to ban the selling of internal combustion engine cars. So I'm optimistic in that sense. But unfortunately, let's say, we have to realize that we're going to suffer in the process. Also, as Steve said, climate is changing. And even developing countries, you have to stop to see climate mitigation as a kind of luxury. And the reason for that is because although, let's say, from a perspective of, let's say, of the historical responsibilities, developing countries are not the ones to blame on that, 
unfortunately, developing countries are much more vulnerable to climate change than developed countries. So that's why, let's say, developing countries have to begin to see that it's on their own benefit to take early actions, even if they are not the ones to blame, but they are, one, they are the ones that are going to suffer the most. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but next year we're going to have the first, uh, what we call, stock take. Basically, next year, we're going to look at the different NDCs, the net national determined contributions of the different countries that they put be before the Paris Agreement to see whether or not what individual countries are pledging is enough to keep the world well below two degrees. And we can already anticipate what's going to be the, the, the response to that. No, we are not on the way to, to, to keep temperature below two degrees or well below two degrees. And lots need to be done. But the problem here, develop or developing countries, when they look at the mitigation that's necessary, the most stringent or the most ambitious you are, the most, let's say, expensive that pathway looks like which is completely, a completely wrong view of the problem. Because if mitigating is more expensive than doing nothing, it's really crazy to mitigate. The issue is exactly the opposite. What's really expensive is not to do anything. Because the, 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 the impacts of climate change, they are much, much, much higher than any cost we may have to try to mitigate climate change. And somehow, let's say, I think minds are beginning to change to realize that, let's say, many droughts we have seen now, if impacts on power sectors all over the world, uh, impacts on agriculture, we cannot handle that anymore. So let's say, that's why I'm optimistic trying to respond, with, respond to the question that was answered, is that, let's say, we're gonna suffer in the middle and then realize that we have to act soon so that well before 2050, I'm, let's say, confident that will happen, we will be net zero because we need to be net zero or even negative. Otherwise, as Anand has said, we will not survive. Well said. Lots of optimism in the room. That is good. Uh, do we have any other questions uh, in person here? Oh, that last step. It's getting everybody. <laughs> Up top. <laughs> then we'll come back to you. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that we have several different pathways that we can look at and move forward. My question is, how do we prevent individual industries or countries from shirking their responsibility by choosing or claiming to choose the plan that is best for them without collaborating under a specific plan? It seems to me that despite the many scenarios, we nonetheless have to collectively choose one which will um, one plan which will have its own particular like winners and losers, um, and how do we get the losers on board with that plan that inhibits them more than others, especially considering any asymmetric um, power relationships that will go into choosing which plan it is. <laughs> You're teeing up the COP negotiations, aren't you? <laughs> Um, I, I don't, well, you're the political science uh, expert in the room, so do you have a quick response? I'll, I'll uh, turn it back to you. Yeah, so just, just very quickly, just very quickly. Uh, you've actually, you know, kind of, in a sense, nailed the question around the architecture of the international climate regime, so I'm not quite sure I can respond very quickly. But just to, just to point out that essentially what we are embarked upon since 2015 with the Paris Agreement is an experiment is an experiment in seeing if a system that's based on a pledge and review model uh, and based on essentially transparency and naming and shaming can produce, uh, you know, can produce results. Uh, and this is the result of uh, having tried a targets and timetables model with the Kyoto Protocol, and that unfortunately uh, had an untimely demise. But uh, I think it's basically, I think, the way to look at it is this is an experiment, live experiment we're engaged in. We have to make it work. The outcome is not uh, guaranteed. Steve, anything to add? Then maybe we'll take another question. Yeah, so um, I, I guess my thinking is, uh, one is that my point about education, right? So helping people actually understand uh, the situation as well as possible and also to understand the alternatives. 
Um, I think it's important to lay out alternatives uh, in terms of characterizing the, these trade-offs and the fact that there are winners and losers. And I, I think it's important to be able to recognize that and also think about sort of how do we then uh, manage that situation going forward. So that, that educational part of it is important. The other part of it is, is, is highlighting the opportunities, right? When we move into a new economy, a new low carbon economy, right? There's gonna be lots of opportunities there as well. Uh, and some, you know, helping those that view themselves as losers in the current economy that would have to change uh, might be useful to also highlight that they could become the winners in the future uh, in terms of taking advantage of, taking advantage of those future opportunities. Uh, it, it, it's not an easy thing to deal with, right? I mean, we clearly have to deal with it not only within this country, but it's, a, it's, it's an issue at the international level as well. Um, this, this issue I was mentioning about cooperation is part of that. Uh, so helping, uh, and we think about we want to move together to a low carbon future. Uh, how can we do it across sectors, across companies, uh, in a way that helps uh, sort of uh, address some of those concerns with respect to winners and losers? Thank you. Let's take another question. There was a few more hands. So we have two up here, one back there. I, um, given rapid urbanization across develop, developed and developed countries, where does green infrastructure and sustainable like development and architecture play in reaching net zero? That's a great question. Who wants to tackle that first? Role of, just to uh, repeat the question here, it was the role of green infrastructure and architecture in um, a climate future. In reaching net zero, what? Right. So, especially in developing countries, and the way we think about cities, and the way we think about green infrastructure. Um, any thoughts on that? Roberto, want to come in? I can chime can in. Can I can I comment on that? Yeah. Roberto, yeah. Yeah, very briefly. Let's say this is very interesting issue. In fact, let's say sometimes when we see those global pathways indicating that some developing countries can reach net zero before developed countries, somehow this has to do with the fact that developing countries, or many of them, are still developing their infrastructure. So it's much easier, one, once you begin to develop a infrastructure, to think of a infrastructure that's much more sustainable than the infrastructure that's in place uh, in, other, in developed countries, for example. So it's much easier, let's say, to have a subway system in a city that is still small than a subway system in a city that already has five or 10 million people living there. So um, again, I have to be optimistic here. Let's say with proper planning, let's say, we, we can think about a future in developing countries which do not need to reproduce uh, the pathway uh, uh, travel by developed countries. This is what we call a kind of leapfrogging. Let's see, somehow you can leapfrog to new technologies, digitalization, inter artificial intelligence, let's say smaller cities, intelligent cities. So eventually developing countries can, let's say, really develop fast in a much more sustainable way. And by doing that, uh, realize that it's much better for them not to follow the fossil fuel pathway, but to have a greener kind of development that will somehow help them uh, to develop that. So again, optimism, and a lot of op optimism here, but I think that's doable. Well said, well said, yes. I, I, that's exactly the point I was gonna raise, that there is this, as you suggested, opportunities, and I think there's opportunities for a lot of communities um, in developing countries and elsewhere to, so, do it right the first time, so to speak, into, instead of having to retrofit um, old technologies and rethink um, the way we did things historically um, in, many, in many parts of the developed world. Uh, all right, let's, we probably have time for one more question. There's the same two hands over here. Up there too. <laughs> when you talk about development, do you mean like transportation? What are you like referring to when it, when you're discussing these ideas? Yeah, so when we used developing and developed countries in that context? 
that what you're asking? And development more broadly. Yeah, good question. So she's asking us to clarify kind of what we mean by development. And I think uh, I think broadly, I think for the most part, I don't want to put words in any of our mouths here, but I think we mean economic development, just in, just rising affluence in terms of you can think of generically as something like uh, GDP per capita, right? But we're thinking, uh, yeah. 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 So um, Deborah's going to be talking about this. Later. Yeah. So you can come to Deborah's uh, keynote. Um, you'll get a nice, uh, an, a wonderful discussion about uh, developments and opportunities. One of the things that was a part of the Working Group Two report uh, this time around uh, was a chapter on climate resilient development, uh, which is what Deborah will be talking about, as far as I understand. Um, and I'll just define that for you, and then just kind of just give you a couple other thoughts. Uh, so this is really about prioritizing sustainable development in that context, right? So think about uh, how can we pursue sustainable development where adaptation and mitigation are just part of that strategy set, right? So choosing adaptation levels with respect to responding to future climate change, uh, choosing mitigation in terms of controlling greenhouse gas emissions and, and managing the climate, and thinking about what individual choices we're making in terms of technologies uh, with respect to the individual strategies we might uh, uh, take on board with respect to adaptation and mitigation in a way that's supporting sustainable development. Uh, so that, that's a different paradigm in terms of uh, the way we've been thinking about it. It's not entirely different. We've been talking, uh, the IPCC has been talking about the implications for sustainable development of mitigation and adaptation uh, for a couple assessment cycles. Uh, but this is sort of turning it around and saying, let's focus on the sustainable development and think about how do we advance an adaptation and mitigation in a way that is going to ensure the sustainable development outcomes. Now, back to your question, if you start talking about sustainable development, you get into all sorts of metrics. Right, so what is it you're actually talking about? And this is actually a, a, you know, a, an interesting challenge, I think, going forward. And it also highlights the fact that regardless of whether you're in a developing country or a developed country, there's gonna be multiple objectives uh, with respect to the future. Uh, so income might be one objective, but equity, uh, energy security, food security, right? You get into a whole variety of things that, you're, that are priorities for society. Uh, so how do we think about pursuing this, th these multiple priorities at the same time as well as, as trying to think about making those adaptation and mitigation choices to be able to support those outcomes? Thank you. I think we have about 30 seconds, and if you want to. Uh, so just maybe just very quickly. I think just picking up on what Steve said, the, the real, uh, real, one of the reasons for optimism is that we are actually seeing the potential synergies between a development agenda, which includes things like income and education and equity and so on, and the climate agenda, right? So these two are coming together in interesting ways. The Green New Deal was an effort to make that more explicit. And regardless of what happened to it, I think that direction is worth pursuing. And this, uh, this prospect of leapfrogging and how we think about development is, is something that is one of the reasons for optimism. All right, thank you to our panelists again. And thank you for Roberto online. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, panelists. Um, I know, I know excellent discussion. Um, I think that last question and the last conversation does feed very nicely into our next session, which is a keynote talk from Dr. Deborah Roberts, the uh, co-chair of Working Group 2 of the IPCC. Uh, that will begin very soon at 410. Um, so if you are not going to attend uh, that talk, I ask you to leave expeditiously. Um, if you're going to attend that talk, Stay with us, um, but we're going to have to do a pretty quick turnover here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to meet you, Tony. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We, got, we got in the middle of that. You realized the broad theme of our uh, yeah. topic was tough. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah, tough, but I think. Uh, yeah, we're all over the place. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are great. Thank you. Yes, sure. She's probably the one who's most. One floor off. Yes, Lindsay said that. My answer is to that. Yeah, I was wondering what you got. All the students are general. So, well, I've been tracking this since, like, 2013, I think. Yeah. And you must have what you find in the